During the 1820s and 30s, the majority of states had extended the right to vote to all white men, regardless of how much money or land they had. Meanwhile, there were many types of reform groups in which women played a prominent role. Many began to oppose the idea that only the true woman was a pious, submissive wife and mother, concerned exclusively with the home and family. All these factors contributed to the new way of thinking about what it meant to be a woman in the U.S. In 1848, a group made up of mostly women gathered at the Seneca Falls Conference in New York to discuss the issues of women's rights. It was agreed that women deserved their own political identities, which included the right to vote. During the 1850s, the movement grew, however, it lost momentum when the Civil War began. Almost immediately after the war, the 14th and 15th Amendments raised questions about voting rights. World War I slowed the campaign, but because they contributed to the war effort, it proved that women were just as hardworking and deserving of the citizenship as men. The 19th Amendment to the Constitution, which granted women the right to vote, was finally ratified on August 26, 1920. Though the movement persisted, it did so slowly and was met with great opposition. Conservatives and anti-suffragists agreed that women needed to further their education rather than gain political rights. However, women would still not have the same rights as men. Many conservatives feared that suffrage challenged the most sacred interests of women and the family state. Both suffragists and anti-suffragists agreed that women were important to the forces shaping American life, although they disagreed about the influence of women in society. Additionally, the opinion of the higher church held great influence over its parishioners, and many looked to their priests for guidance regarding difficult issues. There was suspicion that the Catholic Church worked against the advancement of women and that inequality was the natural order of God's world, when in reality there were few in the church order that really opposed the movement. Women were depicted in a variety of ways in the media during the suffragist movement, including negatively in political cartoons. In fact, this was one of the most popular and efficient ways to bash suffragettes to the public. In these cartoons, black and white or color, women were displayed as mentally immature, insane, in need of physical incapacitation, or too weak to be taken seriously. Other cartoons showed the successes of the movement and the growth of the following that suffragists gained. More than propaganda, drawings and paintings began to display women as commanding a crowd or authoritative next to symbols of power. In addition, advertisements for women's meetings showed suffragettes as Viking-like characters, overall coming across as a dominant force. The program for women's suffrage procession was a tribute to the Women's March on Pennsylvania Avenue, where they demanded the right to vote which was staged the day before Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. It was the first civil rights parade to use the nation's capital as a backdrop, amplifying the cause and reminding about the importance of female citizenship. In their determination to obtain the vote, the march attracted women from all across the country in order to showcase the strength and determination of the suffragettes. The parade caused a small riot and kept women's suffrage in the paper for weeks. This piece, made in 1913, was a 30-foot-long display that recreated the triumphant mood of the event and illustrated the impact of the banners, sashes, postcards, letters, and photographs. The painting's point of emphasis is the horse and rider, as they appear in front of the rest of the subjects of the piece. The elegant details of the rider's dress and horse contrast the whimsy of the background trees, lake, and clouds, which are varying shades of gold and yellow. The Capitol building in the background was an addition to the piece that furthered the celebratory tribute to the suffragettes. The women's suffrage movement inspired later women's and equal rights movements and their art, specifically during World War II when the government created an icon known as Rosie the Riveter. This propaganda piece urged women to join the war effort. Women used the same techniques as in the suffrage movement to protest and achieve their goals. The work throughout history has appeared in many mediums and many styles. Women Like You by Charlotte Newson was created in 2008 
Commission for International Women's Day, celebrating the 80th year of women gaining the right to vote. The work was the first contemporary artwork to commemorate Emmeline Pankhurst, an iconic suffragette. This piece is made up of 10,000 individual images of inspiring women sent in by members of the public from around the world. It celebrates the lives of ordinary women, mothers, grandmothers, friends, sisters, doctors. In short, women like you. Overall, it took two years to complete. It stands almost 10 feet high and about 8 feet wide. This piece is iconic because the subject is such an inspirational woman who caused so much positive change in our society and others. As the work is examined closer and closer, it is seen that the individual images have been tinted or strategically placed to properly depict Pankhurst, and the artist's logo has been added several times, either for coloration reasons or as a signature. The skin of the subject is more pale, likely because the background of the collected images is lighter than skin tone. However, the browns of the, her hair have a softness, though only slightly interrupted by the subject of the individual images. The purple and green of the flowers on the blouse are vibrant, as are the blue of the eyes. Altogether, it's amazing that this level of precision is achieved by only using separate images.